On the afternoon of Friday the 12th of February 1993, a two-year-old boy disappears from a shopping centre in Bootle, near Liverpool. All I knew was my boy was missing and I wanted him back so much. His name is James Bulger. We had this unique and bizarre phenomenon of those chilling images of, of a child being led away by the hand by older children. I do recall watching CCTV and I knew straight away it was James. Despite a mass search to find him, nobody could have predicted the horrific outcome. They were able to get him onto the railway line where they uh, did the most unspeakable things to him. And the circumstances surrounding James's tragic death were incomprehensible. There's no way two ten-year-olds could have armed a two-year-old. You know, it's just impossible. It was clear that this was something that no one else had ever encountered before in this country. A murder so evil, it ignited an unprecedented wave of fury throughout the nation, making this a crime that shook Britain. Friday afternoon in Bootle, Merseyside. Denise Bulger, her son James and her friend arrive at the Strand shopping centre. Denise was in the habit of going to the New Strand because there was a handy bus from Kirby that uh, took her to Bootle. It was indoors and she's got a small child so it's also convenient for that. Denise spends time walking around the Strand before visiting a butcher's with her son. James was with her as they went into the shop and she was choosing whatever cuts of meat it was that she wanted. The young mother has only been in the shop a matter of minutes. While she was concentrating on that and getting her money out of her purse and so forth, she was distracted for a matter of a few seconds. In those few seconds, James disappears from the shop and Denise's life is to change forever. Children do run off. The thing is, it's quite a popular area for four children and uh, I wouldn't seem strange that they would have seen this boy running around. The shopping centre security staff initially put a routine call out for any sightings of the toddler. A child wandering off or getting lost was not uncommon. But when no information feeds back, Merseyside police are quickly drafted in. We were told that James had gone with his mother and her friend to a butcher's and that James had somehow run out. They went looking for him and just couldn't find him. And they searched everywhere, of course. She was panicking, just general searching for the young boy. As each minute passes without James, the search intensifies to try and locate him in or around the shopping centre. It wouldn't have entered your mind that he'd have been taken by anybody. But all they were concerned was for his safety and where he was because it was a busy road and he could have easily been knocked over. Despite hope that James may have strayed off only to be found, the little toddler is nowhere to be seen and the hours begin to pass by. Officers make the decision to widen their search. We search near canals because you always think he might have fallen in. We go and search derelict yards, scrap areas. It's a quite industrial area. It was such a vast area to sort of search really. Meanwhile, Denise is taken to Marsh Lane Police Station. I had police walk in the room and holding a pair of shoes in front of my face and I was shaking my head now, not his. And that was a sigh of, you know, kind of relief then when them shoes were in James's. We just hoped that if he got abducted, that he'd be found alive. And that's, well, we had to be positive and we, we tried to put that sort of feeling within ourselves. You try and glean as much information from locals whether they've seen the boy, have they seen anything suspicious? It was the length of time that we were concerned about. The more the time went on, you were concerned for his safety then. Because 24 hours is a long time for a young, not quite three-year-old boy. Yet the painful hours without James drag through into the following day. Denise and her family remain at the police station, frantic with worry, when officers believe they may have their first major lead. We've shown a clip of two boys what appear to be in, the, in each other's company with one holding uh, James what looked like the taller of the two 
And we assessed the ages to be about 14, 15. Although it wasn't clear, because the films get turned over by day, it's poor visibility. There were young children seen with James, and unfortunately, the CCTV images were, of course, quite indistinct. And I knew straight away it was James. I thought, I've got a perfect chance of getting him back here. There was birds going around, they, they could be classing him as a brother, you know, a brother that they wanted, and they probably got him in a shed somewhere feeding him sweets and here yeah, looking after him. Denise tries to take some comfort in the knowledge that her son could be in the company of other children. It gave me a lot of hope because them days, you know, you didn't think that a child could hear or arm another child. So I did believe I was going to get him back safe and sound. Grainy images from the shopping centre security cameras reveal James walking away from the butcher's shop with two young boys. But the quality of the footage is too poor to identify either one. James has now been missing for over 24 hours. Officers call upon the media and appeal to the public for any information. It fairly quickly on, on the Saturday became clear that it wasn't going to be quickly resolved because he hadn't been found. Just by me, so the butchers turned to him for a minute and then I looked down again. Despite the press conference and CCTV images, no further news filters through. All the Bulger family can do is pray their son will be found safe. These boys had taken James, it appeared, from the New Strand. Were they playing some kind of game with him, perhaps? Was he being held hostage or was he being kept by them somewhere as a playmate? Or had some harm been done to him? We had these two boys and we had to find them. It was assessed that we had to look for boys within the age range of 10 to 18, but we concentrated more or less looking at boys who were about 14, because that's what appeared on the screen. You interviewed local police officers and asked them who do they suspect that would be these children. I was unfortunately in an area where a lot of children were always in trouble, and there was a lot of names put forward. He wasn't with me and I wanted him back so much and we were pleading for these two boys to bring them back. But despite the appeals and residents across the borough pulling together to search for James, the following day brings tragic news. I just remember Albert Kirby coming in and telling me the worst news I could possibly get. Protected under a police tent lies the body of a young boy found this afternoon by children playing on a railway embankment. Denise Bulger and her family have been living their worst nightmare. Their only son, James, has gone missing whilst on a shopping trip, apparently being led away by two young boys. Despite extensive searches, Merseyside police received crushing news two days after his disappearance. James' body was found on a Sunday afternoon on the railway line. I lived under a black veil for a long time after that. Couldn't see beyond that, couldn't hear anything, didn't want to hear anything, didn't want to see anyone. Just wanted to shelter myself away from everyone, just wanted to be left alone. Couldn't believe what I was getting told. And I still believed to that time, you know, James was going to come walking through the door. Thought it was just the worst nightmare I was living. We then face with the prospect that, you know, what the reality is that we've got a manhunt for two small children unprecedented, unfathomable, and that's what the police are dealing with, that's what the press are dealing with, uh, and we had to report it. it. It was and remains, you know, the most uh, astonishing story that I've ever had to go with. James is found more than 48 hours after disappearing from his mother's side. He is just weeks away from his third birthday. They were found by children, not by adults and those kids must be still affected today as a result of what they saw. James is discovered with the most horrific injuries. As his family are given the devastating details, the nation pulls together to hunt for the boys from the CCTV to try and uncover the circumstances surrounding his death. That 
moved the story to a new depth, shall we say, of uh, shock and dismay. And by now, the world's press were descending on Liverpool and the eyes of the world were on Liverpool. Emphasis is now placed on the grainy images of the boys James was last seen with. We spent some time trying to help enhance the CCTV images because the police at that time didn't have the computer technology that we in the media had. We would never thought that the injuries that James had I mean, were committed by two 10-year-old boys. We were still looking at age range 14 to 18. You know, evil sort of children that could have committed it. Merseyside police are faced with limited leads. Along with a continued appeal for information, they release details on James's last steps. From where James was abducted to where he was found, it must be nearly three miles. A long way to walk a young child. But where James was found, they had to climb up the side of a railway bridge, which was very near to Walton Lane Police Station. And in fact, in the police station, you can actually see the railway line. Information from the public floods in, and less than a week after James's disappearance, officers are given crucial details that lead them to the doors of two young boys. Cheers, thank you. I was called to brief officers to arrest two young boys. One had been seen to have paint on his shoes. Paint, along with other items, had been found at the scene of the crime. A woman had come forward to say that she knew this boy and that there was certain paint which sort of was connected with the paint that had been found in James. So I'd sent officers out to arrest Venables and myself went down to arrest Thompson. Can we have a few words? Robert Thompson and John Venables are two ten-year-olds from Merseyside, thought to be truanting from school on the day James went missing. A team of us went to the Thompson's home I had to actually get on my knees to be level-headed with him, sort of face to face, and told him what I was there for and the fact that I was arresting him. And then he started crying. But it wasn't tears there. It was, it, they were crocodile tears. I was, I was taken back a bit. Both Thompson and Venables are taken to separate police stations to be questioned. After the second interview, he actually admitted that Venables had grabbed hold of James's hand. And then he went on, it was like stopping, starting. Yeah, I admit going so far with him, then I left him. And then when we produced other evidence, well, well, you've been seen on the reservoir talking to an old woman. Oh yes, after that, we just left him after that. And then, well, you've been seen after that. Yeah, well, once I'd been there, I left him there. And then subsequently, we got onto the railway line. And that's uh, the investigation, so the questioning was regarding that. He denied doing anything, but blamed it on Venables. And of course we heard that Venables was blaming everything on Thompson. Lawrence Lee was John Venables' solicitor at the time. He was a little boy. Butter wouldn't melt. There was no way that you'd have thought that he'd committed a murder. My feelings began to change after the second interview, because in the first interview he just went on about how he'd been in a part of the city, well away from the Strand. And then he said, we weren't in the Strand, we never grabbed a kid, Mum. And I thought, oh my God, and the uh, walls were caving in at that point. I went home, watched the CCTV footage, and I could clearly see that little boy being walked out of the shopping precinct by two boys, one of whom, which looked like Venables, wearing a mustard-coloured coat, clearly mustard-coloured. So I couldn't wait to get in there the next morning, and I threw the door open and I said to him, First thing I said to him, what colour's your coat? And he said mustard. And my heart just sank. I just knew, well, what am I in? I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. I had to go through stages with Thompson. He was quite clever, and no doubt in my mind, he was the leader of the two. He was feeding Venables what to do. When we interviewed Thompson initially, he denied everything. We had to drip feed him with all the evidence that we had. But once we got to a sensitive point, one thing that Thompson did, and that gave away the fact that he was lying, when you give him a sensitive question, he shuffled his feet under the chair. They just didn't want to put themselves on that railway line, because they knew exactly what they'd done. Specially trained officers spend hours questioning the two boys, and eventually are given news that is to stun the nation. 
John made an admission, and his admission was, I'm sorry, we did kill James. Please tell his mum I'm sorry. John Venables, a 10-year-old boy, uttered the words nobody had dared to believe. A child had admitted to killing another child. Meanwhile, Robert Thompson gives a different story. Thompson told me the fact that he'd taken James with Venables, although blaming it on Venables, of course, took him all the way to the railway line. The assaulter took part. He was there at the initial stage, but he left. There was a lot of facts against both of them. He's admitted being there at the scene. He said that Venables had done most of the injuries, whereas I believe differently. And once you've got enough evidence by an interview to charge him, you charge him. Along with a confession from Venables, compelling evidence from the scene also links the boys to the murder. And the horrific facts that emerge surrounding James's final hours are unbearable to hear. The dragging him through the streets and pretending to be his brother. When they're challenged by, it is said, 38 individuals, either saw him with them or, and some of them challenged Thompson and Venables as to what was going on and why the child was crying. They had a ready story to hand. Oh, he's fallen over, that's why. He's got injuries on him. These are injuries that they'd inflicted. He's crying for his mother and we're taking him home to his mother was the story they told. Very cunning, very uh, knowing, you know, ready with an, an excuse to, that could trick uh, a, a significant number of adults. And they were able to get him onto the railway line where they did the most unspeakable things to him, inflicted the most unspeakable injuries. It must have been the most horrendous ordeal that the child went through. You just can't imagine it. And they then put his body on the railway line. Most of the injuries inflicted on James by Thompson and Venables prior to his death are too disturbing to include in this program. There's no doubt they were trying to make the incident look as if it was an accident and that the train had killed James. They weren't clever to know that, you know, modernised forensic would determine something else. That's how conniving they were. And statements from witnesses reveal the cruel intentions both boys had from the outset. Initially, they tried to push James in front of a vehicle outside the strand. And they also tried to push him into a canal. So they were determined to kill James. With the tragic facts laid bare, Robert Thompson and John Venables are charged with James Bulger's abduction and murder. Two children acting in concert, abducting a child from a shopping centre in broad daylight, bringing him to his end in horrific circumstances and then seeking to make it look like an accident, this is completely, completely unprecedented. This is unique in recorded world history. There has never been a murder case quite like this one. I thought, there's no way two ten-year-olds could have armed a two-year-old. You know, it's just impossible. But when I seen the faces on them, I did believe then that they could have done something. What, what they did do to them. There was a point where I didn't want to live anymore. I just wanted to end everything. If I couldn't protect the James, and I didn't want no one no to protect me. Merseyside police now face their rarest case in criminal history. Two young boys charged with murder. As the nation mourns the loss of James, the public outpouring of grief and rage intensifies. The first appearance in the juvenile court was mid-Feb because I can never forget that day and the scenes outside the court. Feelings were running incredibly high in Liverpool, in the world at that time because it's a natural human reaction. We don't expect children to harm children in this way and so there is some kind of innate human reaction against it which in some people was demonstrated by uh, wanting to go and stand outside Bootle Magistrates Court and act as a, as a baying mob. Two young boys from Merseyside have been charged with the murder of toddler James Bulger. As the public vent their anger and disgust, 
the victim's family try and prepare themselves for an unprecedented trial. I just wanted to see them two going down for the crime that they committed. Following the initial appearance at the magistrate's court in Bootle, just ten days after James's death, the trial for the two children charged with murder is set for later that year and brings further torment. I know they were only ten, but I don't care. They had done the most horrendous thing to me. And more than anything, no one could hurt me other than that. Um, I just wanted to see just a stump for James. There were queues outside the, uh, the court because there were 44 seats available for the public to listen in and uh, they'd be queuing up all night to get in. It was just like a show trial. The dock was too low because they couldn't see over the rails, so the dock had to be raised by 18 inches. So they put a false floor in so they could see over the rails. Your Honour. This is the most grave crime imaginable. I think it would be bizarre if we did not put the criminals who carry out the most serious crimes above the age of 10 through a judicial process because it would be an outrage to the public really if they were not seen to go through a proper judicial trial. And should therefore try this one. There was never any question that this case had to be committed to the Crown Court because nowadays they have a grave crime argument and if a juvenile or a youth is involved in a, in a crime that is grave it has to go to the Crown. But the age of criminal responsibility is different in different countries and in, at that time, in the whole of the British Isles, it was 10. It's right to be 10 and it was 10 and they had to be prosecuted. In a highly charged environment, details leading up to the abduction of James are brought to the fore. It was half term and John was put in charge of the school gerbils and he was very excited about that and he was on his way to school to pick them up when he by chance bumped into Thompson who said to him, let's go robbing, right? Not killing, let's go robbing. And they, were, they went off to the Strand and they were messing around. They had to be back at a certain point in Walton for seven o'clock. I think uh, John's mum was going to the video shop and they were bored. And it was suggested by Robert, apparently, let's grab a kid. John Venables had abandoned his gerbils, gone with him, and they grabbed little James. And they walked him around for hours. They took a route through Everton. There was a lady with a dog, and they asked where the local police station was, and they could have gone into Walton Lane Police Station, and of course they didn't. And they took him up on the railway, and the rest is tragic history. There has got to be some psychological analysis of a child of 10 to establish whether they fully were uh, aware of the gravity of, the, of what they'd done. And I think with these two, I think they did know what they'd done was completely wrong. But I think they ended up feeling very sorry for themselves and not sorry for James and not sorry for the hurt and agony that it inflicted on, on his family. And the disturbing part about it is that they've never apologised to Denise or Ralph. The high profile trial of Thompson and Venables lasts 17 days, finally drawing to a dramatic conclusion. The only time I did go to the court was the last day when I got to see the backs of their heads and all I seen them was shoulders moving where they were sniggling. They showed no remorse whatsoever. I think if I'd have got hold of one of them that day, I think I would have done him all. I sat about ten yards away from Venables and Thompson. And when it returned, when they said they were guilty, Venables knew straight away and started to cry. Thompson looked at me and just glared at me. And I just glared back at him. And then he realised that Venables was crying. So his behaviour changed and he started to cry. But I couldn't see any tears. That's how evil, in my mind, I thought Thompson was at that stage. After the verdict is delivered, the judge takes the unusual step of revealing the identities of the young killers, along with details of their backgrounds. An unprecedented decision in British legal history. Well, the judge is under an obligation. If he thinks that it's in the public interest to know the identity, then he has the power to reveal it. And he weighed up all the circumstances, because until now, Venables and Thompson had been boy A and boy B. I was always against their identity being revealed. Not because of John, I wasn't bothered one iota about John, but he had a family who was completely innocent, of course. The names behind the faces are now in the public domain. 
but the decision is greeted with mixed feelings, and years later will require the killers to be given new identities at a considerable cost to the taxpayer. James's family now have to wait to find out how long his killers will be detained for. At the end of that court case, I was believed that they were going to save many, many years, which were the words of the judge. Officers take him down to the cells. But the final tariff imposed on the convicted child murderers provokes huge political debate and sparks a national uproar that will continue for decades. In the aftermath of the trial, of course, we had the judge setting the tariff that they were to serve eight years. I felt let down. I felt like I had left James down. I thought it was a joke. I felt they were laughing at me, Thompson and Venables, and I felt Thompson and Venables were laughing at the government. I certainly thought they would get ten years. I thought eight years was not enough because it was only going to bring them to 1819. Now, they were only going to be held in children's homes till they were 17. That would mean no real punitive nature to the, uh, to the sentence because they would never serve any time in an adult institution. It would simply be schooling in a special school which was secure. I don't think that would, would or did serve the public interest. I think it was actually detrimental to them. As Thompson and Venables adjust to life in separate young offenders institutes, their sentences are reviewed just 10 days after the trial by the Lord Chief Justice and increased from eight to 10 years. But this does little to dampen the fury surrounding how long they will serve. Everyone was in an uproar at the sentence that Thompson and Venables were given. Um, you know, I can't thank people enough for the way they've even to back, they've still backed me to this day. There was a huge outpouring of disbelief and calls for the sentence to be increased. There was a petition gathered through a national newspaper that was presented to Downing Street. Hundreds of thousands of people signed up, and Michael Howard, who was the Home Secretary then of an outgoing Conservative government uh, who wanted to appease the public, uh, increased that tariff to 15 years. In a landmark decision, the government listens to the swell of public opinion, with almost 280,000 people signing the petition to increase the killer's sentences. Thompson and Venables will now spend an extra seven years without their freedom. I wasn't pleased with it, but I would have learned to live with it. I would have said, well, you know, at the end of the day, they, they have done 15 years, or going to do 15 years, you know, you can't ask for more than that. Because I knew one day they would have had to walk again. You know, I didn't ask them to be locked up indefinitely. This was something that we weren't involved in because we're criminal lawyers, we're not, we're not politicians. And um, they went to new lawyers uh, to appeal to the High Court, but then they wanted to go to the European courts. As representatives for the murderers hit back and quickly argue the decision, the new 15-year tariff is a short-lived victory. The House of Lords rule the increase as unlawful and in a huge blow to James's family, decide to bring his killer's sentences back down. When I got brought back down, when they said it wasn't down to Michael Howard to increase it, it was just another, another knife in the back. And I just thought, how much more can we take as, a, as James's family? It's just one ass after the other. Once the 15 years was a being up, you know, they could have walked and I wouldn't have been looking for them, no one else would have been looking for them. They certainly wouldn't have been looking over the shoulders waiting for an attack on them. Yeah, because at the end of the day, they would have served, you know, an adult sentence for a murder anyway. As the custodial sentences for the youngest killers in the country become a political argument, the nation hope that the boys who committed such a horrific crime will be handed the necessary punishment and rehabilitation. There has to be punishment, but within that punishment, there has to be rehabilitation because they can't be released into, the, into society unless they're sufficiently rehabilitated, unless they're, they satisfy the parole board. But despite the young criminals being housed in detention centres with strict rules and guidelines, Denise and her family receive information that brings little comfort. I was getting drip fed and like a bit of information of how they were getting rewarded on the inside and I just thought, you know, what have I done since you say of this, you know, that they should be getting punished, not rewarded. There's secure accommodation. Every door is locked after he goes into a certain part. But it's a bit like a, a hostel, if you like, as well. And they had full education, loads of good food, and he had television and videos and everything. He had a, a, lot of, a room that a lot of poor kids would be very jealous of. 
the cost of a place at a secure unit can be over £200,000 a year per inmate. Under their rehabilitation, Thompson and Venables are taught to conceal their past, along with receiving an education. There's one-on-one -on -one teaching. Um, you know, there's people who've got to pay for that kind of education. They got a scot free. They were given money to go out on days out. They were taking the swimming baths. They were always escorts, never on their own. They went shopping for themselves as well, buying all kinds of designer clothes. You know, a lot of people out there work so hard and still can't afford things like that for their kids. But they, you know, they're good kids. But these two committed that crime and were given all luxuries like that, designer clothes, you know. It's, it's just unbelievable, the amount of money that was spent on them. Two-year-old James Bulger has died at the hands of two ten-year-old boys in a cruel and sustained attack. Having endured a painful trial to see his killers brought to justice, his family now learn of the treatment they are receiving whilst allegedly being punished for his murder. They were allowed to keep their own bedrooms out. One was a, a Man U supporter, so we had all wallpaper and Man U uh, bed on his bed. Uh, they were given computer games. They were allowed to play snooker. I've never said, you know, lock them up and throw away the cake. I knew one day they would be released, but the way they were, they were treated like that, that's what's the awful thing about it. As Robert Thompson and John Venables serve their time, the debate on how long they should be detained rages. In 1999, the boys, now 16 years old, are given news that devastates Denise and her family. The European courts announced that the original trial in 1993 was not impartial, sending shockwaves throughout Merseyside and the rest of the UK. They're dealing with human beings here who have feelings and emotions, but of course that isn't the way that it gets dealt with. I do feel that the European Court of Human Rights was the wrong place for this law to be set. The European Court decided that while the trial was not illegal, it was unfair, and really they made suggested cosmetic changes, and that's all it is, cosmetic, that uh, there wouldn't be wigs and gowns. I do not believe that you know, judges, from, with all due respect, from nations you know, in Eastern Europe are competent to express a ruling. This announcement from the European courts sparks a lengthy review as to when the killers should be eligible for release, with one of the top lords in the country delivering his verdict. I was hoping he was going to say because of the crime that he committed, he wasn't going to let Thompson and Venables be really silly and he was going to make sure they'd done more time in the secure rooms. And I was hoping and praying that he would have said and go on to do time in an adult prison. But you never. Lord Chief Justice Wolfe was making his decision on whether they should be given authority to apply for parole and he trotted out a whole list of reasons why these two had actually been rehabilitated, how they were model um, pupils and were fully um, entitled to be returned to society because they were no longer a threat and that it would be better for them, in his words, not to be exposed to the corrosive atmosphere of a young offender's institution. There are letters from Thompson to other boys that he was writing to in which he clearly demonstrates that he thinks that the whole thing is a joke and that he's totally obsessed with violence and sex. This is as a 12, 13 year old and clearly is not being rehabilitated and he is just playing the system. A female member of staff had sex with John Venables in the months before he was coming up to be paroled. Is that the hallmark of an institution which was successfully rehabilitating this person to return to society? Despite grave misgivings from James's family, Thompson and Venables are cleared for release just six months later. In the summer of 2001, they are given new identities, at an estimated cost of a quarter of a million pounds each, released into society and provided with secret locations to live. They are 18 years old and have spent no time in an adult prison. The whole entire family felt really upset and open arms and couldn't believe you know, they were getting released. It was one of the main talking points of the family for a long time. We still couldn't get our heads around it. I was led to believe if either of them got into any more trouble, I would be the first to be contacted and know about this. I don't believe they should have been given new identities. I think it's absolutely disgusting. 
you know, there's hospitals without machines there that, you know, save kids' lives, saves anyone's lives who are screaming out for money to buy these machines. So I think to give these new identities the amount of money it's costing, I think it's absolutely disgusting. These hospitals should be getting that money, not them to. I don't believe that they are in danger from a baying mob, personally. I think they could be accommodated somewhere in the UK at a secret location without having to change their names and they could live their lives and live with the consequences of what they've done. To give them false identities means they have to live a lie. We couldn't get in touch with any of the family, myself or any of the family. Um, so I thought, you know, it's a bit of, bit of comfort, but I thought, well, hang on, does that mean to say I'm a prisoner in Merseyside? Can't I venture out to Merseyside then, in case I bump into one or both of them? I think they should have kept their, their own names. They should have done the 15 years. They would have been out now. They would have been living normal lives. Although I'm still without James, they would have had to live with that. For nine years, the killers of James Bulger re-enter society and continue with their lives under strict guidelines. But in 2010, a chilling crime brings one of these infamous criminals back into the public consciousness. I was surprised when Venables was rearrested because it came completely out of the blue. There was no forewarning of it. I was just hoping and praying that no one else was hurt or murdered by either of them. And that was my only wish, don't let them hurt anyone else. It was broken in the press before it was publicly stated. How on earth the powers that be thought they could keep that secret? I have no idea. They really are not in the modern age of the instant media. Obviously, they've got a different agenda to follow, but it must be in the public interest to know when uh, a, a criminal of his notoriety is re-arrested. News quickly spreads that Venables has been re-arrested, but in a shock decision, Justice Secretary Jack Straw withholds the reasons from the public. I'm sorry I can't give more details at the moment. I appreciate the very intense public interest uh, in this. But parts of the media retaliate by suggesting why the murderer has been arrested again. And eventually, the government is forced to speak out. The police were called into his flat or apartment, wherever he was living. They went through his computer, which Venables tried to snatch the computer off them and tried to smash it up into bits. As thick as he is, the police managed to get the computer off him. And that's when they found all the child porn on it. Rumours that James's murder may have involved a sexual nature circulated when he was killed. Now this new allegation calls Venables into question once more. I was absolutely blown over by news that it was Venables. When that came out, I just couldn't believe it. After considering all of the evidence... On the afternoon of Friday the 12th of February 1993, a two-year-old boy disappears from a shopping centre in Bootle, near Liverpool. All I knew was my boy was missing and I wanted him back so much. His name is James Bulger. We had this unique and bizarre phenomenon of those chilling images of, of a child being led away by the hand by older children. I do recall watching CCTV and I knew straight away it was James. Despite a mass search to find him, Nobody could have predicted the horrific outcome. They were able to get him onto the railway line where they uh, did the most unspeakable things to him. And the circumstances surrounding James's tragic death were incomprehensible. There's no way two ten-year-olds could have armed a two-year-old. You know, it's just impossible. It was clear that this was something that no one else had ever encountered before in this country. A murder so evil it ignited an unprecedented wave of fury throughout the nation, making this a crime that shook Britain. Friday afternoon in Bootle, Merseyside. Denise Bulger, her son James and her friend arrive at the Strand shopping centre. Denise was in the habit of going to the New Strand because there was a handy bus from Kirby that uh, took her to Bootle. 
was indoors and she's got a small child, so it's also convenient for that. Denise spends time walking around the Strand before visiting a butcher's with her son. James was with her as they went into the shop and she was choosing whatever cuts of meat it was that she wanted. The young mother has only been in the shop a matter of minutes. While she was concentrating on that and getting her money out of her purse and so forth, she was distracted for a matter of a few seconds. In those few seconds, James disappears from the shop and Denise's life is to change forever. Children do run off. The thing is, it's quite a popular area for, for children and uh, I wouldn't seem strange that they would have seen this boy running around. The shopping centre security staff initially put a routine call out for any sightings of the toddler. A child wandering off or getting lost was not uncommon. But when no information feeds back, Merseyside police are quickly drafted in. We were told that James had gone with his mother and her friend to a butcher's and that James had somehow run out. They went looking for him and just couldn't find him. And they searched everywhere, of course, she was panicking just general searching for the young boy. As each minute passes without James, the search intensifies to try and locate him in or around the shopping centre. It wouldn't have entered your mind that he'd have been taken by anybody, but all they were concerned was for his safety and where he was. Because it was a busy road and he could have easily been knocked over. Despite hope that James may have strayed off only to be found, the little toddler is nowhere to be seen, and the hours begin to pass by. Officers make the decision to widen their search. We search near canals, because you always think he might have fallen in. We go and search derelict yards, scrap 